I was actually born in Hungary and came to this country in 1939, August 39, two weeks before the war. And I was then enrolled in a local grammar school, although I didn't know any English. Uh, I took the matriculation at the end of that year. <clears throat> and uh, two years later, uh, I managed to get into Cambridge. Uh, I always wanted to be a physicist. And uh, somehow I conceived the idea that Cambridge would be an interesting place to be. And fortunately, I got in. I didn't realize how difficult that was. Um, I took a degree in '44, and then I joined the Cavendish Laboratory under Bragg uh, as an assistant to Max Perutz. Um, we did the very first uh, X-ray structure had ever been done at the Cavendish. It was a four heavy atom, three, uh, about ten light atom structure. Um, <clears throat> from there, I moved to London when I got married in 1948 and joined the vision, first the Vision Research Unit and then the National Institute for Medical Research in Mill Hill. Um, by that time, uh, it was possible to do a little bit more with crystallography, but very difficult to do anything of any size. Um, in '62, I moved to, Ca to Cambridge uh, to the Department of Chemistry, um, which was headed by Alex Todd, Lord Todd, a very distinguished figure and a very perceptive head of department. Um, he took me on um, at the time when it was very unusual for crystallographers to be in a chemistry department. In fact, there was a lot of suspicion uh, by chemists that this upstart subject was taking up uh, their territory. But uh, coming to the chemistry department, I was accepted very quickly and in fact, I managed to persuade the department to buy a diffractometer, the first diffractometer ever used for small molecule studies. So for the next uh, period, I worked with a gradually increasing group, a very small group, supported by the Medical Research Council. And we did a variety of chemical problems, gradually going towards antibiotics, substances of medical interest. Uh, there was a very exciting period doing the structure of ATP, the high energy compound, with Neil Isaacs and various others. It was the first time that we used direct methods and a very early application of direct methods. Uh, later on, we worked in bigger and bigger substances uh, a lot of antibiotics, a uh, very important one, uh, vancomycin, which is a uh, last-ditch antibiotic these days. And there I was enormously uh, helped and by George Sheldrick, uh, who was in the department. And uh, there was a kind of symbiotic relationship between my group and George's group so that we were coming up with increasingly challenging problems and George was improving the uh, methods for tackling it. And the very last phase of my life as a small molecule crystallographer was when uh, it became possible to synthesize uh, oligonucleotides and in the chemistry department, this was a natural place to do it. Um, at that time, Steve Salisbury joined me, and uh, we had a very exciting, long period of working from simple fragments of DNA to different forms of DNA, to particularly to um, mispaired base matches, which was the first uh, atomic resolution picture of what uh, DNA uh, helix looks when the base pairs are mismatched. And we finished off with increasingly complicated DNA 
motifs, double-stranded, triple-stranded, and also DNA-drug interactions. And although looking back, uh, that work is now uh, completely overshadowed by the macromolecular uh, crystallography of today, uh, where you can look at, not at small fragments, but actually long uh, DNA helices complex with uh, proteins. Uh, even so, I think it was worthwhile because it showed the way and uh, ultimately, step by step, it led to what is modern uh, structural biology. And that's, that's about all my time at the, as a head of the uh, chemical crystallography group in the chemistry department. It's difficult to go back that far, but a lot of people there were uh, ultimately finished off as fellows of the Royal Society. Uh, there was A.J.C. Wilson, there was Lipson, um, Bragg himself, of course, and Max Perutz standing out. Um, several other people, I, um, I can't really quote names uh, anymore, but uh, uh, it was a very lively, uh, go-ahead, uh, optimistic group at that time. Well, first of all, we had enormous support from uh, the heads of department, first Alex Todd, and then Ralph Rafel, and eventually Brian Thrush. Um, there were any number of distinguished chemists there. And of course, in my own group, gradually, more and more very able young people joined. I think it'd be difficult to pick out any one name because uh, I can't quote all of them over a long period, but uh, uh, there was certainly a most enthusiastic and able group that somehow got drawn into the work we were doing. The origin of the CCDC, Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center, I think goes all the way back to the formation of the International Union of Crystallography in 1948. Um, at that time, crystallographers were already interested in data, and uh, so the union set up a commission for crystallographic data under Bernal, who was uh, particularly interested in data. Well, Bernal appointed me, God knows why, as secretary of the commission, and then told me that my first job would be to uh, set up a wine list uh, classified according to different experts because, as he said, the data commission was set up at, in the interest of crystallographers, which is quite right. But that also uh, cemented my friendship uh, with Bernal, and uh, he conceived the idea that it would be important to start to collect the existing crystal structures and look at them from a different aspect than that of the original investigator. He thought that bringing together data from many sources, one could discover new rules and new knowledge. Um, so we applied for a small grant and uh, employed a postdoc to transfer the data about the then known structures on punch cards and cut out the edges of similarities so that we could use knitting needles to uh, collect the relevant uh, data, the relevant structures. Um, now, at the beginning of 1960, um, the entire data scene was dominated by the US and the USSR, and no other country had any serious effort of compiling data. So it became very worrying internationally, and it was decided to set up 
a commission for uh, data in science and technology, co-data, and ask different countries to offer a subject that they would support and so enlarge the scene. So the Royal Society and the Office for Scientific Information sent a scout round the UK to see what they could discover an area that the UK could offer to support. And they found our little man in the attic at Birkbeck using his knitting needles. So they thought, this is splendid. That's what we are going to do. And so we, they invited Bernal and me to submit a plan for a crystallographic data center to be supported in the UK. Um, this was my first ever grant application. I didn't really know how to do it, but, um, and Bernal unfortunately wasn't well enough to take a great part. However, I did prepare the plans and they were quite ambitious. Um, I was encouraged to submit plans for a building and a proper institute. So I had these roughly drawn plans. I had something like 15 uh, staff. And already at that time, I thought it was very important to involve active scientists as well as people who would be collecting the data and analyzing it. This plan was submitted in Washington at an international meeting. And when we came back to England, uh, I was offered a grant. Nothing like the grandiose scale uh, that uh, they encouraged me to put forward, but uh, I think uh, one or two uh, postdoctorals and an assistant. It was naturally going to be done in Cambridge because by that time I had moved to Cambridge and uh, Alex Todd very generously accepted to house this new unit. So this really is the origin, origin of the uh, crystallographic data center. Um, at that time, uh, while I was in the States, I was actually offered a ready-made database by Ray Pepinski, who was uh, uh, one of the people very active in using computers in uh, crystallography. But when Ray offered me that, I realized that his offering was a poison chalice because uh, the data was completely unchecked. And so I very pol politely declined. And when we got home, I thought about it and I believed that one of the fundamental principles should be that we do not put anything in that database that cannot be checked as far as possible. Um, and we could also at the same time follow this idea of using active research workers. And indeed, in the beginning, it was almost entirely active research workers and people who were abstracting the data. Um, Now, uh, in 65, David Watson joined me. Uh, he was one of the first to take a very active part in the development of the data center. And jumping ahead a little, I've been very fortunate that several very able people, particularly Frank Allen and Sam Motherwell and Robin Taylor, all came, joined us, uh, took great part in building the enterprise Sometimes they left and they came back again. Uh, so there was a continuity here uh, that was extremely valuable. We started collecting data. The first objective was to catch up with the backlog. And there were about 1,200 crystal structures at the time, so that we managed within the next short period to catch up with that and also to incorporate new papers. 
we first concentrated on the bibliographic information because already at that time it was beginning to be a little difficult to find out what structures were actually published. And this in spite of the fact that the International Union was making great efforts to keep the data, uh, keep the publication lists available. So the, we started building up the bibliographic file and uh, in order to uh, bring it back to the community, we began to publish books, uh, the uh, Molecular Structures and Dimensions series, bibliographic volumes. These volumes were already computer typeset. Uh, we were real pioneers in computer typesetting. And all the programs had to be, well, all the programs for the uh, search of this bibliographic file had to be developed in-house, not by computer specialists, as would be done today, but by the crystallographers themselves. Frank Allen wrote some, and David Watson wrote some, and we were able, with the help of people who were doing the computer typesetting programs, to produce these volumes very rapidly and quite economically. Uh, the next phase was to prepare the data files. Now this was rather more difficult. The abstracting of the data obviously was uh, not easy and especially abstracting it accurately. And here we brought in the idea that every number that we put in, if possible, should be checked. So the check programs were pre developed which took the author's coordinates, recomputed the bond length, compared the bond length against the published bond length in the tables, and flagged any discrepancies. We also searched the structure for unacceptably close contacts. And once this was done, if we found any errors, we either tried to correct them ourselves when it was a simple transposition, or we got back to the author. And in this way, we managed to do a lot of clearing up of the literature at the time when accuracy couldn't be guaranteed as easily as it is today when you actually transfer the results of an X-ray analysis directly from the computer to the database. And then the, so with this file, the big file, we did publish two volumes of uh, molecular structures and dimensions uh, actually showing the uh, molecular structure, uh, many of them hand-drawn, and also the bond length and bond angles and some annotation. But we only managed two volumes because the data was by then growing so rapidly that it was quite obvious that it was impossible to keep up uh, with the publications. And also by that time, it began to be feasible to distribute the data on computer tapes. So uh, this is, at this point, our publications pretty well ceased. Um, indirectly, ha having these publications, which we jointly published with the International Union, um, had a repercussion on our funding situation because uh, the funding agency, OSTI, uh, in the second re grant renewal, uh, thought that we should, uh, they should take away some of the money we earned from our publications and uh, abate the, the, some of the money that they gave us. A much worse situation was when they uh, renewed the grant the third time, because at that time they told us that uh, 
if your data is worth anything, you need to get a substantial part uh, 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 without our help. And that left me really in despair because at that time, the idea of anybody paying for data was quite inconceivable. Uh, if you wanted data, you sent your research student to the lab and you got it to the library uh, and uh, you got it this way without any expense. So our first idea was to see if we couldn't sell data, individual data items. And although we offered it at one pound a go, there were no takers. Uh, now, I was, as you can imagine, extremely worried about this. And when I went to scientific meetings, not actually as the honorary director of the data center, but as a bona fide crystallographer presenting papers, uh, I talked to my friends there and asked their advice, what shall we do? And uh, Walter Hamilton of Brookhaven National Laboratories happened to be at one of these meetings, and he got the idea, he thought he is going to try and obtain some funds. But tragically, Walter Hamilton died, and so there was no possibility of applying for funds. However, another uh, American crystallographer, Jim Silverton, from the National Institute of Health, said, I have some money left over from my last grant, which I have to spend this year, so I might just as well spend it on the Cambridge data. And he followed that up by getting funding for two more years. So it was 1972 to 1975. And that was the first national data center. The idea emerged that instead of relying entirely on British government support, we would try and involve other governments internationally, and in return, distribute the data that we were collecting to these national centers, where they could then serve their national communities. The American center followed very closely by the Italian, and particularly by the Japanese center, which again came out of a meeting uh, with senior Japanese crystallographers during a general crystallographic meeting. And the idea of an international network of data centers caught on quite rapidly so that the numbers rose from 17 to 30 uh, to 60. Uh, I don't know how many there are today, but it's a worldwide network uh, which serves the entire crystallographic community. Curiously, as, as far as industrial users go, uh, very curiously, my memory fails me. I do not remember even which the first industrial company was. I have a feeling that it was ICI, but I may not be right. Um, I think what happened was that because of this very wide distribution, of the data in national centers, young crystallographers got used to having the database available to them. And when they moved to industrial companies, they suddenly found that they were cut off because they were not going to obtain that from the national centers. And so they, instead of our salesmen, we had no salesmen at the time, persuaded their own companies to join. And once this started, it absolutely snowboarded because of the enormous competition between, say, pharmaceutical companies. So they couldn't afford not to have something, even if they weren't very sure that it was all that useful. Um, another reason, I think, why the industrial companies were able to come in and use the database is that from very early on, we made a decision not to publish the crystallographic coordinates of the atoms, but publish something we called the uh, 
chemical crystallographic unit so that the data they received was already containing in it the chemical structure, the chemical unit, and they didn't have to have expert crystallographers to disentangle the symmetry operations in the various crystal structures. But this became enormously important, of course, for our future continuity, because the balance swung towards the end of the 80s from being mainly supported through national centers to uh, considerable support from the industrial companies, again, worldwide. Uh, we started the database because of Bernal's and my idea that uh, a collection of data from different individual experiments will allow us to make new discoveries. And so it was very natural uh, that the members of the data center themselves, including me, uh, were making use and making pioneering use of our wealth of information there. My own collaboration was particularly with Robin Taylor, uh, who brought a lot of very original, very interesting ideas to the group. Um, we very naturally started with looking at structures and developing the basic, the standard nucleic acid base. And that was followed by a whole series of studies on the hydrogen bond, which were very important and uh, very uh, well received in the academic community. They defined uh, important hydrogen bonds, uh, particularly in biological systems. Um, at the same time, people like Frank Allen uh, were doing a variety of studies, uh, again using the database itself. Um, and the uh, number of annual publications on data was rapidly growing. We didn't have the term of data mining at the time, but that seems to be the uh, standard uh, understanding now of uh, how you make use of collections of information. Nine years after the fun, uh, founding of the data center, office, OSTI was dissolved and the uh, Science and Engineering Research Council took over. Um, this one very good news for us because whereas the Office for Scientific Information was specifically uh, charged with looking after information, in the Science and en Engineering Research Council, we were uh, competing against uh, proper fundamental and applied research. Nevertheless, they were very generous to us, and they kept funding us over the next uh, many years with rolling grants. That means we had grants for four years, and every two years we had to represent our case, I'm afraid, to new committees, and convince them again and again that uh, this was a worthwhile enterprise to support, but also yet he had more and more support from, as I mentioned earlier, from uh, different sources. Uh, the chemistry department itself uh, was extremely supportive. Uh, they not only embedded us in the department itself, but we were fully accepted as part of the university. And so they extended all kinds of facilities to us, most importantly, computing. Uh, so much so that when a decision was made for the first central computer, uh, we were part of a very small group presenting our case for an IBM computer to a committee. So we had no problem at all in getting sufficient allocation of computer time. And tremendous support 
from the uh, computer science department. Uh, our real problem was that with the enormous expansion, really enormous expansion of the number of publications, we had to bring in more and more people, uh, partly to abstract the data, to check it, and uh, to develop computer programs so that the information could be searched. And there was no space in chemistry, or there was very little space. And we did all kinds of things that we could think of, having it outside, having it in the biochemistry department. And towards the end, we actually hired porter cabins, which were situated in the back court of the chemistry department, and where all our, well, a large number of our staff were camping out, literally camping out. And we lived in fear and dread of the Cambridge City Council demanding that we take down these temporary huts. So that really uh, was the path towards uh, becoming independent of the university. But the other very big factor was that from being a British group embedded in the chemistry department, we have become a truly international organization with international support, international interactions. And it was no longer appropriate for us to be housed as part of the university. But again, I must emphasize that the university was so generous to us that whereas they acknowledged that it was a good idea if we became a separate charitable organization, they offered us the opportunity of remaining a teaching institution of the university, which would allow us to bring in research students and to maintain the academic standard, which we have stressed right from the beginning. So I think in that way we were a very unusual data center, and I don't know if there are any even today which are any data centers of any size which have been and are in that situation. Perhaps it would be interesting to mention the influence of the CCDC on other databases, um, particularly the Protein Data Bank, uh, which actually began because Max Perutz came back from a meeting of protein crystallographers. And at that meeting, they discussed the problem of accessing each other's data. There was no way that they could publish all the data, and there were no channels of uh, passing information between the different groups. So Max asked me to s begin setting up the protein data bank much on the same lines as uh, we did for the small molecules. Um, fortunately, uh, Tom Kurtzel of the Brookhaven National Laboratories uh, was present at this meeting or shortly after it, and he got the idea that he would like to do it. And I'm extremely glad that I never took that project on because it would have overshadowed the small molecule crystallography and it would have brought in an no enormous number of problems. Uh, it is now a highly flourishing enterprise, but entirely supported by the, U well, not entirely supported, but supported largely by the US and several other governments. And uh, it would have uh, completely unbalanced the crystallographic database. Another uh, database which I got involved with was the nucleic acid sequence database, where Fred Sanger of the Laboratory for Molecular Biology um, began the analysis of nucleic, made it possible the analysis of nucleic acid sequences. And it occurred to me that with our enterprise in data collection and 
analysis and his ability to his knowledge of the uh, nucleus sequence world, we could set up something together. This didn't happen for a variety of reasons, but I managed to persuade John Kendrew, who was director of the European Molecular Biology Laboratories, to take on the project, and they, be they started the nucleic acid sequence data bank. We in the UK uh, ran a national service with the support of the Medical Research Council uh, distributing the database to workers in the UK. So we really already at that stage had a broader interaction with other databases. But of course one of our most important interactions has always been through the International Union of Crystallography. Members of the CCDC served from the time I was secretary of that first committee for crystallographic data throughout as chairman and uh, uh, active members of the uh, commission. I used to report to the uh, IUCR executive every three years at international congresses. We jointly published the original publications, as I already mentioned, and at a later stage, when it became important to unify the submission of data to journals, uh, in collaboration with the IUCR, we developed the SIF input format, which first was used by the union publications and then used by many other publications worldwide. And finally, and this is perhaps not very well known, when the data center charter was set up at a later stage that I have a word a talk about a little later, the copyright of the database was left to the International Union. The idea being that if at any time the data center was not able to continue it, the Union would have the first right to offer this database to other people who thought they might continue it. And this became very important, at, although I'm jumping ahead a little now, at a stage where Robert Maxwell, the publisher, got the idea that he would take over the data center because we poor scientists didn't know how to look after money and he would really support us. And he made a very determined effort to uh, capture the data center, but we could always come back to the fact that it was not ours to give it away, it was copyrighted already to the International Union. So there was this very close relationship with the Union, and that was of course, as I mentioned earlier, a very, very close relation with the crystallographic community. And the very fact that our people who were asking for data were themselves contributing by active research made our standing in the community quite different. We were not an alien body. We were part of crystallography group and trying to do this together. So I think that was a very significant factor in the success of the enterprise. Well, in 1987, uh, when the time was ripe, we went to the charity commissioners and asked for permission to set up a charitable company under English law, um, which was to be for the benefit of crystallographers and scientists worldwide. Uh, we obtained the uh, permission and the CCDC was set up as a charitable company by guarantee so that each of the original members uh, guaranteed, I think, one pound. Uh, the first board of governors consisted of David Phillips, who was an enormous help in setting it up, Ralph Rafel, who was head of the department, Jack Lewis, um, who was head of inorganic chemistry and also a great user of crystallographic data, 
um, Jackie Truter and Jack Nernitz from the ETH in Switzerland and Jenny Glasker from the United States. So that the board was from the beginning an international board having representatives of other countries. Um, the position of Ralph Rafel uh, was, so to speak, a hereditary one. He was there as head of department and subsequently his place was taken by uh, other heads of department, particularly Brian Thrush and David King. Uh, the composition of the board changed very slightly during my time, uh, except that David Phillips resigned and uh, Louise Johnson took over as a representative of the larger molecule community. In all this, I have, of course, omitted the professors and the lords and the sirs, but I think that is understandable. Uh, the, I think what I ought to talk about next is the new building, which was a very significant development in the history of the CCDC. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, space problems became increasingly pressing in the department. And I was wondering how we are going to find new space and adequate space for a growing number of staff. Um, talking about this to Jack Lewis one day in the department, <clears throat> Jack looked out of the window and said, uh, why don't you build in the grounds of the department? Uh, as you probably gathered from this interview, I've all my life been very ready to jump on other people's ideas. And I thought, well, really? Can we do that? Why not? Um, we approached the university uh, who were not averse to leasing a piece of land in the grounds of the department, but the un understanding right from the beginning was that it was only going to be a 75-year lease and ultimately the building and the plot would revert to the university. Uh, the next question was the question of architects. Uh, now it so happened that a very eminent Danish architect, Eric Christian Sorensen, had designed a house for me here in Cambridge when I was a young research student and with very little money. The house is absolutely wonderful as a place to live and work and bring up a family. Uh, and I was so impressed by him that uh, I thought it would be a good idea if we asked Sorensen uh, to design the building. Unlike today when I'm involved in some rather bigger building projects, I had no idea that this was a very unorthodox way of doing things, that I should really go out for the competition and the shortlist and tenders. I'm afraid none of that was done. I simply found out that my architect was still active and well-respected. I phoned him up and that's where it all started. He came over to this country in 1987-88 and we started talking about the new building. Now, I already learned from building my own house that the role of a client in such an enterprise is to define very clearly the immediate and long-term needs, but it was not the role of the client to put any constraint on the architect as to the style of the building, the organization, the materials. Um, unless one did that, there was quite a possibility of a disastrous result with the clients and the architect's ideas all mixed up. So when Sorensen came to Cambridge, I told him first of all that the building had to express the international status of the data center. 
And then the other requirement, not the practical requirements, but the conceptual requirements were that it should be a place which would foster both individual creativity and cooperative work. Beyond that, we broke down through a discussion with all members of the data center what kind of practical requirements we had in the terms of space and layout and uh, uh, potential use. And on that basis, Professor Sorensen designed. Now, for various reasons, which I no need to go into, we had a long process of build, designing buildings in various uh, parts of the chemistry grounds. Uh, ultimately reaching a very unpromising site right at the back of the building and overlooking a very desolate small street in Cambridge opposite a city uh, housing uh, car park, blank wall of a car park. But with this unpromising start, the architect managed to develop a truly beautiful building, um, so much so that the year after it was uh, completed, it won the very prestigious Building of the Year Award by the Royal Commission of Fine Arts. And just to emphasize the uh, relationship between the university and the data center, at the award ceremony, which was by Betty Boothroy, the Speaker of the House, uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge was present, as well as the architect and myself. <laughs> it was an enormous honor, and it was well worth all the effort and trouble that we put into the original idea. <clears throat> the funding of the building was done entirely from our own money. This, I think, is extremely unusual. We didn't go out asking for funding and sponsors, but it so happened that with the delay of several years, because we only started uh, building in the early 90s, the data center earned more and more money, which we carefully squirreled away, and also, it was a period of high inflation, so very high interest rates. So as we went on from the original estimate of 1.1 million pounds for the building, where I threw up my hands in horror and said, we can't possibly do it, we haven't got anything like that money, we ended up with 2.8 million pounds for the whole man building, which we managed to pay completely from our own funds. I think this is a very unusual situation and a very happy one because it gives you a lot of freedom to create something really beautiful. Of course, no story is always so smooth and although the building was beautiful and suitable for its purpose, there were problems. Um, one of the main problems was the cultural difference between the way the Danish uh, culture looks at light, they spend a lot of time in the evenings with just candles, no great illumination, and the kind of lighting demands that are found normally in England. So we've had a lot of trouble with lighting. There was also some problem with the heating system. But all together, I hope the staff enjoyed the working conditions and the attention to detail, such as workstations, coffee stations at uh, every section, and a bright and uh, inspirational lunchroom full with flowers and looking out on a little terrace. It was, I feel it was a real privilege for me to take part in this, and that it reaps something permanent in Cambridge in the form of a distinguished building. In 1965, when we started, computing was in its infancy. Uh, and we 
really learnt on the job. Uh, our aim, of course, was to be able to compare different data items. And the very first data item was the bibliographic references, so that we developed a program called Bibser, which actually searched the uh, recorded literature and allowed one to pick up either by name or by uh, year or by journal or actually by chemical class. Because when we first set up this search, we had no idea how one could search for chemical classes. So all we could think of was to take the then existing database and David Watson took a chemistry textbook, copied out the main chemical classes on cards, sorted the cards out so that they were roughly equal piles, and then we assigned each structure to one of the 86 chemical classes. Most of these classes were chemical, but we did introduce a number of functional classes, which in the end turned out to be very useful. Classes like steroids and antibiotics, uh, due to our involvement with uh, the Medical Research Council, we were naturally thinking of biologically important classes. The other two main search programs were the data, uh, data search and the connectivity search as the two other files developed, so that we were able to track down individual data items and, of course, to search for chemical connectivity. And the last piece of this um, suite was the visualization programs. Crystallography relies highly on visualization, <coughs> particularly in three dimensions. And so the program Pluto uh, was developed mainly by Sam Motherwell, which allowed the display of molecules in three dimensions, or crystal structures in three dimensions, and in many different uh, representations from the Borland uh, spoke to uh, the uh, space filling models. Um, all these programs have, of course, over the years evolved and became much, much more sophisticated until today the data center has a beautiful suite of programs which are, I think, very much appreciated by the use of the data set, database. Initially, actually, in the first days, we were not the only suppliers of uh, the search programs. There were two or three other national centers which also uh, developed search programs which were used locally. But in the end, it settled on the Cambridge system, uh, although with input ideas from the whole community. Um, the one last remark is that, although it's inconceivable today, many of these programs were not developed by professional programmers. It was very much later uh, in the history of the CCDC development that we actually engaged professional programmers. Much of that relied entirely on the ability of the extremely able band of young people who joined me to pick up computers, pick up computer language, and design their own programs. In 1992, 1993, uh, we moved into the new building, and by that time I had retired from the Medical Research Council, so for the first time I became not an honorary but a proper scientific director of the data center. Um, the first few years were really quite difficult in that we had to learn to stand our own feet, uh, manage all the practical affairs uh, that are associated uh, with a large organization and also, of course, absorb new staff and continue developing uh, new computer programs. Um, 
one of the things that we had to face was the exponential increase of the number of new papers published. And so we had to try and change our methods of obtaining the uh, data from abstracting in journals to direct input to direct interaction with journal editors. And through the development of our Czech programs, we also got in a situation where we actually acted as referees to a number of journals, and they could send us this information directly. Um, we also had to struggle with the proliferation of different programming systems, of different uh, types of computers, and cope also with the uh, practicalities of distributing uh, all this information, first on tapes and then ultimately from, the data, from Union Road on CD-ROMs. Um, we used to have uh, panic stations at the time of each new release because uh, at that stage of computer science, it was essential to try out the different versions of the release on different computers. And people used to rush around, not just Cambridge, but outside Cambridge, to find su suitable computers where these could be tried out. As far as uh, abstracting of information went, we had to keep on developing the programs uh, for coping with this data and also training uh, and involving our editors in making this as efficient as possible. Nevertheless, we found it a real hard struggle to keep up with everything. Um, the data center, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was able to take on research students, and so the data mining, which at that time still wasn't called data mining, uh, could be continued as research projects. And the staff itself, again, Frank Allen and uh, uh, Robin Taylor, when he ultimately joined us, rejoined us, uh, also continued uh, scholarly publications. So we never lost the direct contact with the community. We never became an organization over, besides, or above the other crystallographers. There were not many new directions until towards the end of my time, uh, which was about 1996, 1997, about the same time as Robin Taylor joined us, uh, when uh, Isostar was developed and the gold docking program, which was quite a departure for uh, the data center of small molecules, was also developed by the center. It was obvious that uh, some new directions had to be found since we couldn't live forever on the uh, inheritance we had from our days at the chemistry department. Um, I retired in 1997 and I'm very happy to see that the data center was taken over by new directors, first Dave Hartley and then Frank Allen and now Colin Groom, who have continued what I tried to establish, a tradition of a scholarly group serving the international community. I'm very happy that the so-called business plan has worked and that the center is able to get the funding uh, without having to make any grant applications to sustain the standards that we originally set down. You asked about my career in inverted commas as a scientist. Um, I actually took my first degree, as I mentioned, in Cambridge in 1944, and I never got a degree. I only got a degree I would have got had I been a man. And then when I went on to the Cavendish Laboratory, uh, it wasn't deemed appropriate for me to try and get a degree, a PhD degree. Um, 
over the years had the embarrassment of uh, declining to be called Dr. Kennard. So I was delighted when in, I think, 1973, the university awarded me a degree of SCD and I was at last uh, able to call myself legitimately a doctor. I don't think that was so much a, a deliberate effect, but merely the prejudice in my earlier days against women scientists. There were not very many of them, although uh, those that were were em very eminent, and indeed the first fellow of the Royal Society was Kathleen Lonsdale, and one of the few women Nobel Prize winners was Dorothy Hodgkin. Uh, you can imagine my happiness when I was elected to the Royal Society and admitted to this uh, fellowship of uh, eminent scientists in our National uh, Academy. Um, other honors came to me in a variety of ways, but perhaps I'd just like to mention two. To my great surprise, in 2002, uh, the university offered me an honorary degree, which was a great occasion with my little grandchildren running along the procession saying, look at Granny, look at Granny. Um, and uh, in, 19, in 2007, um, I quite unexpectedly was offered the Bildstein um, Gemelin Medal, which again, is very nice when these honors come when you least expect them. A more general recognition uh, came through the Medical Research Council uh, when I was awarded an OBE, um, which also gives me the opportunity again to stress how much I and the data center owe to the Medical Research Council, who gave unstinting support, not just monetary, but uh, moral support in the work we were doing. It's extraordinary that they believed that they should allow me to spend the time they paid for uh, in spending on data activities. So I, I think I'm greatly indebted for that. And I did appreciate an OB, even if I'm hard to put by to keep up my husband, who's got something much better. <laughs> it was a big change from a very busy uh, life uh, at the CCDC to retirement. Um, but I was extremely fortunate because uh, seven and a half years ago, I was nominated by the Royal Society as trustee of the British Museum. And so I had a chance in these years to join the work of a great institution uh, and get to know and work with a great director, uh, Neil McGregor. Um, my role was partly to be uh, a liaison with the science and uh, conservation groups, which are very good, and in the last many years now, took part in a big building project for an expansion of the museum. And that's where I learned how I should have made the Cambridge Data Center. Uh, so altogether, that's been a very uh, rich and rewarding uh, period. And also at the time, of course, I've had to learn to uh, do less and uh, uh, enjoy life without so many responsibilities. The Data Center was always run on lines of entrepreneurs. And so I don't remember who got the idea that we should recycle used paper and used cards, which we then sold and bought with the proceedings wine, which was enjoyed by the whole group. Uh, we also used to run a splendid uh, Christmas party uh, where we invited people from far and wide and which were just uh, run on a few bottles of sherry uh, 
and some mint spice and Marks and Spencer cakes, but they really, really were very much appreciated. Everybody was asking for invitations. Another uh, episode I remember quite disconnected with this is that at the time uh, when uh, we were visited by various parties in connection with the building of the year prize, um, Princess Margaret came along and wanted to see the building and have tea with us. So we had an extraordinary afternoon, Sunday afternoon, sitting around the table at the data center with Princess Margaret and her ladies in waiting and offering them, I'm afraid once more, only Marks and Spencer biscuits. She said, oh, these are very good. Where did you get them? Uh, but that again reminds me of quite another visit which was much more serious. Um, the Chancellor of the University, Prince Philip, heard about us. Uh, we had never dared to officially invite him, but he asked to be invited. And he came and spent a whole afternoon at the data center and seriously wanted to know what we were doing, wanted to learn and was actually uh, given an opportunity to run some searches with, uh, under guidance on the database um, and then meet all the staff. That was a really memorable occasion. My most significant contributions, if I look back, are twofold. One is on the science side, um, where my achievements looked at from today's perspective are very small, but nevertheless, for the time, uh, they seem to be important. And if I can pick up just a few, uh, the first one is a rather silly little thing, which is a method I devised as a research student for orienting crystals on a goniometer. Up to that point, uh, it was only done by experience and eye. And I hit on a little method whereby you could do it by measurement. Now this is almost trivial, but it was one of the uh, most popular reprints I've ever had. Uh, the other were ATP, vancomycin, which is a last ditch antibiotic, and which at that time was a very difficult structure to solve. And some of my contributions to the DNA, understanding of DNA structure, uh, which again, as I mentioned earlier, were very difficult at the time. Uh, but of course, on the other side, I think my main contribution was the establishment and uh, nurturing of the crystallographic data center which I hope leaves a good legacy.